new and uh, mysterious um, field of freshwater ecoacoustics, um, which is um, what we're going to I'll do more detail in a minute, but um, is using acoustics to, to understand um, freshwater environments. So first of all, um, we should establish that freshwater ecosystems are under threat. And under threat, perhaps more so than any other ecosystem on the planet. Um, wetlands are being lost three times faster than, than rainforests are globally. We've actually lost 84% of freshwater species since 1970, which I think is just absolutely shocking. And 97% of freshwater megafauna, like this uh, huge freshwater stingray here, have been lost in that same time period as well. And in the UK, um, we have a particular issue with peatlands, uh, peatland bog extraction. And peatlands are incredibly valuable freshwater ecosystem. And although they account for just 3% of the world's land surface, they store twice as much carbon as, as forests. And obviously when we uh, extract the peat from these peat bogs, all of that is released. So freshwater ecosystems therefore are um, very valuable for, for biodiversity, um, but they're also really valuable for, uh, for climate change as well. So, um, and they're, you know, they're, they're in, a, in a pretty bad state. So we need to more than ever understand these ecosystems and, and see how we might um, conserve them, but also generate um, enthusiasm for conservation as well. Okay, so um, before I get into uh, the ecoacoustics, just touch on some of the traditional methods used to survey freshwater ecosystems. And um, really one of the main ways is to survey for macroinvertebrates, the beetles, the bugs, um, all of those insects and, and everything that live in freshwater environments. And that's typically done by, um, you see in this picture here, sweeping around with a pond net um, and collecting up all of these bugs. But um, there are some problems with these methods. Um, they're quite invasive, it's sometimes damaging the environment when you do this. Um, you only really capture one point in time, unless of course you go back regularly and sample over a long time period, but that's costly and time consuming and very labor intensive. And then in order to be able to ID the species that you're collecting, um, you often need specialist expertise and the species need to be killed as well so that they can be viewed under a microscope to see these incredibly uh, fine details in their anatomy that is required to get down to species level. Um, so it's a fantastic way of surveying freshwater ecosystems, um, but there are some problems with it, perhaps. Um, so Uh, instead, or perhaps as well as doing this, uh, there is it's taking an incredibly long time for me to change between slides here, for some reason. Here we go. Um, Ecoacoustics, which is um, instead of getting in there and, and disturbing the environment, uh, we're simply listening to the environment. And we do that using uh, this equipment here. So um, a hydrophone or an underwater microphone is connected to a recorder and then a pair of headphones um, just with a simple um, setup of equipment. Um, you can hear um, this amazing, bizarre world um, of the, uh, the, the underwater world in the, in the pond. Um, and the advantages of this is that it's non-invasive because you're just you're just listening there and you can capture um, variation and, and change over a long period of time by, uh, by setting up um, automatic recording devices with big battery packs and, uh, and just set them going for, for often months at a time. Um, and there's no need to kill target species or things that you're interested in. Um, if that, um, we have some of the, uh, you know, the basic information about what we're trying to study, which I'll come on to later on. Uh, so Bernie Krauss is, um, is an American 
a musician and acoustic ecologist. And he is um, in many ways, one of the, uh, the founders of um, this field of soundscape ecology more broadly. Um, and there he, well, he described or helped describe this concept of the soundscape, which is all of the sounds in an environment at any one time. And he's divided the soundscape up into to different parts. So there's a geophony, which are sounds made by natural phenomena, weather, um, earthquakes, things like that. Uh, the anthropony, which is um, sounds produced by humans, of course, vehicles, seismic surveys in the marine environment, um, like pictured here, is, is a big one and um, is a major threat to marine mammals. And then also the biophony, which is all the sounds produced by the animals in the environment, and that's what I'm particularly interested in. Um, now, of course, um, sound is incredibly important and has a lot of biological significance. Um, and it's used for a whole range of different functions, like attracting mates and asserting status, uh, locating prey, transmitting information like I am to you now, avoiding predators, um, a whole host of things, far more than I've listed here. Um, and I think it's quite nicely demonstrated um, by this, uh, this red howler, um, which um, I'll, I'll play in a minute, a video of, um, of it calling. Um, but we can, as well as um, just watching these animals call, we can, when we record them, we can visualize the sound that they produce as well. And we do so in a spectrogram, which is this figure here in the bottom right. And a spectrogram plots um, frequency or the, the pitch of the sound as a function of time, which goes along uh, the x-axis here. And so this is what the sound you're about to listen to um, looks like, as it were. Uh, there we go. So yeah, quite um, an extravagant use of uh, use of sound there. Um, and we know quite a bit about terrestrial soundscapes, and that obviously coming from a, from a tropical rainforest. Um, and one of the interesting things we learned was this uh, idea of acoustic niche partitioning, where um, different species will call at different frequency bandwidths, as to avoid competing with each other. Um, and this can occur in different frequency bandwidths, but also over different uh, periods of the day, for example. Um, but this is a nice example of um, some frogs um, doing this. And you can see here that these different species are calling it slightly different species as to not um, compete with each other. Um, we also know a fair bit about marine soundscapes now as well. And there have been some fascinating things that we've learned about the marine environment just simply by listening. So um, we now know that um, the sound of a healthy reef, a healthy coral reef, can be an orientation cue to draw in um, pelagic fish larvae and, and also crustaceans um, into the reef um, so that they can then colonize. And I guess the idea is that they know, as it were, um, that this is going to be um, a good place to come and set up shop. Um, and also this is being used in uh, coral reef restoration projects um, whereby um, people like Steve Simpson are playing sounds of healthy coral reefs in, um, in areas that uh, perhaps aren't quite so healthy in order to attract these species in and then um, you know, restore the reefs. I, I, that's absolutely um, incredible that, that we can do that. Um, and also we have, um, we've discovered that humpback whales, um, we all know that they sing, um, but they also can share their songs. It's like they have, they have hit songs. Um, so there are whales out there, the, the, the abbas of the Pacific Ocean. And if these songs are particularly good and um, lots of girls like them, then they'll spread and they'll spread horizontally through the population. Um, and, and they become popular and they become hits. Um, so there are these amazing stories that we're discovering about uh, the marine environment just by listening. Um, and I mentioned that um, we've recorded whale song um, and everyone knows it, of course. I mean, in 1970, there's, uh, this album was released 
Songs of the Humpback Whale. And that did phenomenal things for, for marine conservation, for whale conservation, by capturing the sounds that these produced because for the first time we, for the first time we could um, relate to these animals um, in a way that we couldn't before. We could anthropomorphize with them. They were singing um, and often um, in distress. Um, but what about freshwater ecosystems and their soundscapes? Well, freshwaters are uh, very often overlooked um, ecosystems, um, but they do have, nevertheless, amazing soundscapes, absolutely packed full of uh, biological information. So um, the stage is set um, for us to discover equally amazing things in freshwater ecosystems. And, and I wonder if we could achieve even just, you know, one tenth um, of the conservation impact of recording whale songs that we could do with recording the sounds of freshwater ecosystems, um, then that would really be quite amazing. Um, but it's an incredibly new field. The first description of underwater acoustic diversity in ponds occurred in 2015. 2015, it's a really, really new field of research. Um, and there's, a, there's still a lot that we don't know about freshwater soundscapes. Um, and there are three main challenges, as I see them, that currently face the field of freshwater ecoacoustics. Um, and they are that there's a lack of a species-specific uh, reference library, a reference library of species-specific sounds that we don't have. Um, and that's a problem because we're not able to properly identify animals yet, or a lot of them, um, just by collecting this sound, whole soundscape data. You've got to often record them in isolation build a bigger picture up. Um, we also have a limited understanding of um, soundscape ecology. Um, what I mean by that is how the different species compositions in um, pond ecosystems or rivers um, influence um, the soundscape. What makes a pond really noisy, for example. Um, and then finally, we also have a limited understanding of soundscape phonology. So how the soundscape changes on a daily basis and then also on a yearly basis. So these three things um, are going to form, um, loosely speaking, um, the structure of the rest of the talk. And I'll touch on each of them um, as we go through. So what's capable of producing sound in fresh waters? Um, well, um, before me, um, Camille uh, at the Natural History Museum in, in France did a PhD, um, and she was responsible for this first description on, of temperate uh, on soundscapes. And as part of her PhD, um, she did a literature review of um, all the different soniferous or the sound producing species that you might find in fresh waters. And she found there were 271 just in France. So globally, um, there must be, well, a you know, lot. Um, and well, 27 amphibians, a crustacean, a few fish, but by far the most specious um, group is the insects. The insects are producing most of the sound in freshwater soundscapes, it seems. Uh, but even aquatic plants make sound, um, which I found absolutely amazing. Uh, when I recorded aquatic plant sounds for the first time, I thought there was something wrong with my recorder. I was um, you know, fiddling with a headphone um, jack and I thought that maybe it's like some interference you get from your mobile phone on the recorder or it's just a totally bizarre sound. Um, and I'll play it for you now. And they make this sound, by the way, by releasing um, oxygen bubbles as they're respiring in the hot sun. Um, so you can see that hopefully here. Um, there is some bubbles coming up here. There are some bubbles being released as the plant is um, respiring in the sun. Um, and then that sounds like this. So kind of like a ticking, ticking sound. And then there's a spectrogram here below showing that. So at the beginning of my PhD, oh, I, um, I also did a literature review, um, but I did it with Camille as well. Um, and we record, we, well, we analyzed 124 different research articles. And what we were interested in doing really was 
we're seeing um, of the literature that's out there already, um, which taxonomic groups are getting the most research attention? Because we know um, that the arthropods, the aquatic insects, really they're driving um, a lot of diversity, making a lot of sounds in freshwater soundscapes. Is that being reflected um, in the research that's, that's happening? Um, no, basically. Um, a lot of people study fish, which is, um, is fair enough. 44% um, of the studies we, we looked at studied fish. And it's probably because um, they're bigger, a little bit more charismatic. Research institutions have got aquaria often and the facilities exist already um, and the know-how to, uh, to keep and to record fish. Um, so that's probably why we think. Um, only 26% of the studies um, investigated arthropod sounds, um, which considering that insects and arthropods uh, you know, make most of the sounds by far, um, we think is a, a little bit of a shortcoming. Um, and then we also found that since the 1970s, um, there's been this shift in the research from studying the sounds produced by single species, which really would be bioacoustics, towards studying the whole environments, whole soundscapes, which is ecoacoustics. Um, so insects produce sound um, in a process called stridulation, which I think is a fantastic word. Um, and it means rubbing two hard body parts together, kind of like um, one of those wooden frogs. You ever have one of those wooden frogs at school with uh, the little ridge back and you go right, right, like that. That's similar to uh, the way that these animals are producing sound. And these are some microscope, microscope images that I took of uh, water beetle on the top and water boatman on the bottom. And these are some of the key sound producing insect groups in fresh waters. And this is some of their sound producing anatomy. And it has these ridged structures um, called files and, and scrapers and plectrums. And they rub these together to produce sounds. We've, we've known this actually for a long time. So a lot of the species identification books that are used to identify water beetles, water boatmen, all have very detailed uh, descriptions of the sound producing anatomy that they have. And they have different sound producing anatomy because we're using that to differentiate between species. And if they've got different sound producing anatomy, then surely they make different sounds. So we've known for a long time um, that these uh, species must be producing different sounds, but we haven't yet properly um, started to record or to char characterize these sounds. So there's a lot of potential there um, to, to create a, a really great reference library of um, macroinvertebrate sounds. So um, here's some um, sounds that I've recorded. Um, now the, we've known about water boatman sounds for a long time, so this isn't exactly uh, groundbreaking, uh, but just to show you, um, this is uh, a water boatman here on the left. Here in the middle, we have uh, the spectrogram, the visual representation of its sound. And then these numbers here on the, the top spectrogram just represent um, areas in which I've used to, to measure and to quantify the uh, sound. I'll touch on that in a second. Um, now, water boatmen are quite amazing, really, with their sound production um, because they're incredibly loud. Um, a particular species of water boatman, Micronectar, um, which is not this one here in the picture, it's a different one, but um, it's capable of producing an incredibly loud sound, louder um, than 227 marine and terrestrial mammal species when it's scaled to, admittedly, it's quite small body length. Um, and people have even reported being able to hear these sounds made by the water boatmen as they're walking next to the pond. So really amazingly loud sounds. And it sounds a bit like this. quite an eerie rap, 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 rasping sound. Um, and uh, that recording I recorded uh, in my bathtub uh, in the lockdown, got some uh, water, be water boatmen from the pond. And uh, my uh, very tolerant also biology PhD housemate um, let me record them <laughs> in the bath. So there we go. Um, and then once you uh, start understanding uh, the different species that you have producing sound, um, then you can start to understand and appreciate the soundscape of the pond. 
that's what I've got visualized here. Um, and actually, um, there's biological sound that's being made right up um, to nearly 30 kilohertz. And we can hear about to 20 kilohertz or thereabouts. So it's going you know, beyond um, our region of uh, our actual um, you know, biological um, anatomy can, can facilitate for us to hear, um, which I think is interesting. Um, and this is what, um, this is Old Sneed Park Pond in Bristol, and this is what it sounds like. So you can hear hopefully a mixture there of the stridulation sounds, the water boatman and the beetles rasping away, but also the droning repetitive sounds of the aquatic plants as they respire. Um, but also you can hear decompositional processes as well as methane bubbles explode from the sediment below um, and pop on the surface. So there's an awful lot of information that um, we can gain from uh, about you know, freshwater ecosystems, about ponds, um, just by listening. Um, so here are some uh, water beetles that I recorded. I uh, recorded the sounds of these two water beetles, the cherry stone water beetle and the super tramp water beetle um, and I recorded these in a in a tank um, which had a holding net in um, where I would place the beetles so that they would not swim and, and bounce and touch the hydrophone or the, or the tank wall and then by recording these sounds um, which I'll play in a second I was able to uh, return some basic descriptive statistics like um, you know the the loudest frequency the dominant frequency and mean frequency etc in order to be able to, to characterize and to describe these sounds, um, which hopefully research um, in the future will be able to do um, on a much bigger scale. And then we can start um, you know, maybe uh, detecting these species automatically. Uh, but this is a cherry stone water beetle. And then a super tramp. So I hope you can hear that they're they're quite different, the sounds, um, which I think is quite promising. Um, we know they have different uh, sound producing anatomy and we know they make different sounds and they sound quite different. So hopefully we'll be able to um, uh, be able to detect them. And that's important because beetles are really valuable indicator species in freshwater ecosystems and you can do some really interesting things just by knowing which species of beetle you have um, so the most common one is and by using these scoring sheets and there are different types of scoring systems available but um, the general idea is that different taxa get different a uh, different number of points based on um, the type of water quality you find them in you find them in better more pristine ecosystems they have more points um, and so um, by understanding which beetle, beetles you have you can understand water quality condition of the ecosystem and it would be cool if we could do that just by listening um, also um, you can tell the age of a pond based on its beetle communities and the study in 2008 showed that um, in younger ponds you typically get these Diving beetles, the, the types of beetles that I recorded um, were on the last slide. And then as the pond ages, you get weevils and, and leaf beetles. Um, so perhaps we could infer um, ecosystem condition, but also the age of a pond, um, just from understanding the sounds made by different species of beetle, which I think would be exciting. Um, now there have been um, some advances in in uh, trying to achieve this. Uh, the study in 2015, Wilson uh, tried to do this, well, they did quite successfully, I guess. Um, although it was from 
lab sounds um, rather than from sounds in the environment. They recorded these beetles uh, in the environment in the lab. Sorry, uh, they described them like I showed on the slide before, and then they used machine learning in order to be able to differentiate um, between those um, three species calls, and they actually managed to uh, you know to to classify um, these species pretty accurately, up to 98% um, for one species. Um, but these were distinguishing between calls in the laboratory. Um, doing that with calls from the environment, I guess, is a whole different story. But um, this shows that it's possible. And uh, hopefully with advances in machine learning and spectrogram recognition techniques, we'll be able to um, automatically detect these species. Um, so I'm just going to touch now on, on some of my research um, using um, a slightly different approach to characterize um, the restoration success of, of ponds. So um, we're in the UK, uh, a lot of our ponds are located on farmland and are surrounded by um, intensive arable land. So um, ponds become incredibly important oases of life in an otherwise quite barren landscape. Um, however, many farmland ponds have been filled in or they've been neglected. And these old farmland ponds used to be mile pits or clay pits, um, which were used to um, make bricks from and to, and to build houses and also to lime fields, to uh, fertilize the fields, basically. This is long before um, fertilizer. So all these old ponds um, that once had a use uh, since the Second World War um, and the development of fertilizers, and modern agriculture have been neglected and, and become overgrown, like you can see in the bottom left here. And we've actually lost 75% uh, of our ponds in the last century. Um, but a Norfolk farmer, Richard Waddingham, um, helped pioneer this method of um, bringing these ponds back to life um, with the Norfolk Ponds Project. You see here in this landscape, there's, there's lots of ponds here waiting to be restored. Uh, the process of pond restoration is quite simple, really, if you've got a digger and a team of people. Um, and it could be done in an afternoon. Uh, the idea is, is that you remove some of the trees from the edge of the pond to let the light in, and you expose the seed bank um, by digging out a lot of sediment that's um, accumulated in the pond from leaf litter and lots of other stuff that's accumulated in the pond and um, you know, clogged it all up. Again, you get rid of that, you spread it over the fields, fertilize them, and then you expose this seed bank. Crucially, you want to leave this. This is the sediment that was being laid down by the, the pond in its glory days. And it's full of old aquatic plant seeds and, and it's black magic gold, really. It's, it's, it's stuff waiting to come back to life. And when you expose the seed bank, you let the light come in, all these seeds will, will start to germinate and you'll get um, sometimes really rare plants um, that have been lost in the landscape come back. Um, and it's, it's quite an amazing um, thing to see. Um, but um, you can see it, you can also hear it. Um, and this is the sound of an unmanaged or overgrown pond, a neglected pond. And this is um, what it sounds like in the water there. So there's really not much going on there at all. And then when we listen to the managed and open canopy ponds full of aquatic plants, um, this is what it sounds like. So there's this really big difference as um, all the insects start colonizing again and the aquatic plants are respiring. All the sound comes back and the pond is rejuvenated and, and back to life. And like I mentioned before, because we don't have a reference library of species specific sounds that I could use um, in order to be able to pick out all these species coming back, um, we have to use a slightly more uh, basic method um, and that is to count original sound types or unique sounds. 
Um, and that's this is it's, it's quite a common way of quantifying biodiversity um, in freshwater soundscapes at the moment as the field is is developing. Um, and by counting the different types or the number of different types of sound types um, in each pond, and I listened to 10 ponds, um, did five uh, unmanaged ponds and five ponds that have been restored. I counted the sound types in, in each of them. Um, and I what well, we found that uh, the species, the sound richness, uh, the, the number of different sound, sound types increases dramatically um, in the restored ponds, which uh, obviously no great surprise, but lovely to show. Um, and also the, uh, the abundance, the activity is, is greatly increased in managed ponds. And then this ordination below, um, this NMDS analysis shows that um, the soundscapes were very different as well between the unmanaged and the managed ponds. They're clearly separated there in ordination space owing to the different species communities that are in them. But interestingly, all of the ponds as well are quite separate. So each pond has got its own unique soundscape. And I think that's what's so magical about ponds is that no two ponds are the same. There's a lot of variation, which makes them so, um, so brilliant for biodiversity. And that's shown here um, in, the, uh, in the composition of their, of their soundscapes. Um, now, a slightly more um, standardized way and uh, proper way perhaps of, of analyzing soundscape data is to use acoustic indices instead of counting just sound types. And it's a hell of a lot easier as well because counting sound types just me takes a long time. Um, now, the basic principle of acoustic indices is that you collect data on sound cards, and then you import this data into, uh, into R and you can calculate um, values um, in an automatic way and a standardized way um, of different acoustic indices. And um, in this figure here in the bottom left, uh, I've got a couple of acoustic indices. There are many more than this, but this is a few common ones. And if we take uh, the acoustic um, complexity index, which is, uh, this is A here in the top left, um, it just explains how this um, index is calculated. So basically these uh, white boxes represent one kilohertz frequency bandwidths. And um, each kilohertz frequency is considered and then compared against each other um, and you get a value um, at the end of it. Um, with the bioacoustic index, which is C below, um, that's a bit more specific and that targets um, the biophony where all the supposedly um, where all the biological sounds are happening and then compares that with values happening outside of the biophony and so the biophony here in, in this example would be between those white lines there um, and you can tweak these indices based on the type of data that you have um, but basically the point is, is that they're, they're standardized and they're automated um, and you can analyze uh, large amounts of data quite quickly um, and spits it all out into a spreadsheet, which you can then plot um, values over time. Um, so that's a, a way of, of, um, of analyzing soundscape data in a slightly more efficient and standardized way. And with this in mind, I helped um, develop uh, the, one of the first, I think it was actually the first uh, standardized um, sampling protocol for ponds using acoustics. And we came up with this method of um, recording in 10 different microhabitats around the pond. That could be um, areas around um, lots of reeds or out in the open water of the pond. Um, and recording for one minute in each of these 10 microhabitats. And then after that, calculating um, acoustic indice values for each of these one minute segments in order to quantify uh, the biology in the soundscape. And what we showed was that um, with the largest data set collected of only 24 ponds, 
uh, which is amazingly the largest data set, but shows how much more research we need to do. Um, we showed that with the bioacoustic index, which is the index that focuses on the biological sounds, um, it actually um, has this gentle correlation with habitat suitability index. Um, there's a lot more research that needs to be done here, of course, but um, indication there that we can use acoustic indices uh, to assess habitat quality using this method. You can also use acoustic indices um, to observe uh, the soundscape phonology, which is another one of these uh, challenges facing the field. And um, here, um, Gottesman in uh, 2020 recorded in a Costa Rican swamp. And they recorded over a period of 28 days, and they were interested in characterizing the diurnal soundscape patterns of this swamp um, using acoustic indices. Um, and as you can see from the spectrogram in the bottom left, they found that um, it was a lot more acoustically, the swamp was a lot more acoustically active at nighttime. And it was kind of moderately acoustically active during the day. And there were these periods of relative quiet during dawn and dusk, which is quite interesting. And I'll come back to it later. Um, but also you can see that overall trend I've just described represented um, in some of these figures on the right hand side, in particular in B in the bioacoustic index. So um, freshwater swamps um, have very clear then uh, diurnal soundscape patterns. But what about temperate ponds? Uh, what about them? So uh, this is um, some of my other research from my PhD. I'm interested in, in finding that out and, and we hypothesize that um, well, they must do. They must have um, more acoustic activity, presumably, and that um, they would be different between sites as well, owing to um, the different species communities and compositions in these ponds. These are the ponds that I studied. So um, four in and around Bristol, um, and then one um, back home in Exmouth. And in addition to some of the acoustic monitoring, which I'll touch on in more detail in a minute, I also did some monitoring of macroinvertebrate communities there. Um, and very generally speaking, um, what we found was that the um, noisier, for lack of a better phrase, uh, soundscapes were characterized by um, all the usual suspects of, of um, noisy, um, well, noisy bathtubs in my case, the water boatman, the micronectar, that's the species that makes this incredibly loud sound, um, and also the water beetles. These are species that are associated with acoustically active soundscapes, and that's what we'd expect, so that's good. And then um, some of the quieter soundscapes characterized by these, um, these larvae, these uh, more lake community type species, and also uh, some mollusks. Um, then I wanted to, uh, using this macroinvertebrate data, and by calculating different acoustic indices, um, try and establish which acoustic indices um, are biologically meaningful. And so if we know that um, insects produce the most amount of sound in freshwater soundscapes and the loudest sound, um, and if we know that in this data set in particular, we have um, water boatmen, beetles and bugs, um, more associated with the, the louder soundscapes. And then perhaps to capture biological sound, uh, the biophony of freshwater soundscapes, I'd focus um, just in this case on um, true bugs, so the, the water boatmen really, um, and try and identify an acoustic index um, that represented uh, the richness of these true bugs um, at, the, at the different sites that I studied. And really the, uh, the normalized different soundscape index uh, or NDSI uh, was um, particularly good, it seems, at characterizing um, water boatman, diversity of water boatman richness at these sites. And the normal, normalized different soundscape index is very similar to the bioacoustic index in that it focuses on that part of the soundscape 
um, in which biological sound is, is occurring, the biophony. Um, so it makes sense to me then that, um, that this would be uh, the case. Um, and then interrogating this a bit further, um, I have all of um, the acoustic indices. Um, so this is from um, 168 hours of recording um, at each site. So recorded for an entire week. And um, I collected all of this, uh, all the data from the acoustic indices for each hour. So 160 uh, rows for each site. Um, and also calculated the standard deviations of those for each hour. Um, we did this because um, the standard deviations and sometimes reveal slightly less obvious patterns within the data. Um, and then I assigned um, each of these hours, um, whether they were a daytime hour or a nighttime hour, and then used a random forest classification uh, model to, to work out, to identify which of these uh, variables, which of these acoustic indices are uh, most useful for determining between um, daytime and nighttime soundscapes? And this is done by um, taking 30% of your data set and using that to train um, the model and say, this is what a daytime hour looks like and a nighttime hour. And then with the remaining 70% of the data, you test it. And it tests it by running these um, classification trees, hence the name random forest. And at each node of the tree, different variables are analyzed and a conclusion is reached based on what we know from the training data as to whether we have a, a daytime or a nighttime hour. And in the figure on the left here, um, the blue dots represent where I've tested for daytime or nighttime hours. And model had about 82% accuracy. And it showed that um, this second indice here, entropy mean, um, was particularly good at distinguishing between daytime and nighttime hours. Now, entropy mean just considers the entire bandwidth of the soundscape. Um, so I think that um, is, is logical in some sense that if you're, in, if you're considering more of the soundscape, more of the data, therefore, um, then you're more likely to see these differences. Um, but I also um, was interested in um, seeing with these green dots on the left figure, um, differences between sites that had um, two or more species of water boatmen versus sites that only had um, one or none. And when I did that, with 94% accuracy, um, we could see that the, uh, the NDSI, the Normalized Different Soundscape Index, um, was by far the best at, um, at di differentiating between these, um, these true bug dominated or, or sparse soundscapes. So that corroborates um, the correlations from before that the NDSI is a pretty good um, index indice um, for determining you know, which of your pond soundscapes is, is full of bugs. And so I've plotted this index over time. And uh, the lines in each of these figures represents a seven day hourly average. So each hour is a value averaged from seven uh, days of recording. Um, and well, first of all, um, what we can see is that um, a lot of the ponds possess very clear uh, diurnal soundscape patterns, um, which is excellent. So there's, there's definitely some variation between day and nighttime soundscapes, um, but also they're very different from each other. There are some similarities, but, but they, um, they're also unique in some respects. So Old Sneed Park um, and Abbott's Pool are, are fairly similar. And like the Costa Rican Swamp, they have um, a lot of activity in the night, moderate activity in the daytime and in these quiet periods around dawn and dusk. And perhaps that's because um, a lot of the aquatic plants haven't quite yet started to respire. A lot of the insects um, are calling at nighttime, it seems, um, and they prefer low light intensities and low temperatures. And so these intermediate periods uh, aren't really eliciting um, sound producing behavior in them. 
Um, but also, it's, that's the time when, when fish are on the prowl, when they're hunting for insects, so perhaps they're trying to stay quiet at that time. Um, but it's showing here that we have um, insect dominated nighttime soundscapes and macrophyte dominated uh, daytime soundscapes. And this dotted line going down the middle of the figure here uh, represents the, uh, the solar zenith of the day. Um, also, Tube Magnum Reservoir E, uh, the final box of the plot at the bottom, bucks the trend slightly um, and has an enormous amount of activity at night time but very comparatively little during the day. Um, and that site contained by far the most amount of um, beetles and bugs. Um, so clearly a uh, macroinvertebrate dominated soundscape. Um, in addition, I also calculated um, using the data I collected, a, uh, we tried to work out how long do you have to uh, deploy the hydrophone for until you've captured um, a significant portion of the soundscape variability. Um, so to do this, um, I randomized all the data, all the um, hour, hourly means, I ra randomized them all up from all five sites um, to remove any effect of, of diurnal variation from the data. And then I calculated the standard error cumulatively over time and then plotted that. Um, so deployment time here is um, the, really the, the pseudo hours, as it were, these randomized hours that I've calculated. And then um, what we see is that the, the variation in, in standard error rapidly decreases. Um, it rapidly decreases in the first five hours of deployment, in fact, by 51% from the first value um, in the first five hours. Um, and then by 55% after 24 hours and, and by 62% after 48 hours. Um, but really, in order for it to start flattening off, um, you need at least 57 hours of recording. Um, so I think um, the message here is that um, if you're recording in freshwater, if you're designing a survey to monitor freshwater ecosystems, in particular ponds, then um, you need to record for at least five hours, but ideally um, 57 hours in order to capture um, a lot of this uh, diurnal variation and that you need to factor in diurnal variation to any design, uh, any survey design, because clearly it has um, a significant influence um, on the values that are returned by acoustic indices. And also that you may well miss uh, key sniferous species if you only recorded, for example, um, at dawn or uh, at midday, you might miss some nocturnal insects. So very important to capture um, all of this diversity. And then finally, um, I'll just quickly touch on um, some of the public engagement um, and science communication that can come from recording sounds um, in the environment. So. Uh, this is my friend and uh, collaborator, Tom Fisher, uh, AKA Action Pyramid, uh, who's a musician um, who does a lot of field recording. Uh, so recording sounds in the environment and recently was involved in this river sounds project in the River Lee. And um, if you're interested, go and check it out. It's a pretty cool website where um, by moving the cursor to different parts of the screen, you can uh, listen to different parts of the river soundscape. Um, and also Tom and I, we're making an album together, which isn't something that I thought I'd do during a PhD, but I'm very glad I am, um, which tells the story of the day in the life of a pond using its soundscapes. So um, going from this insect dominated nighttime um, to uh, the plant sounds, of the hot respiring uh, periods of the, of the, the midday sun. Um, so I think like with the whale conservation, but in a, <laughs> in a much less impactful way, perhaps. Um, recording sounds in the environment, as well as providing um, a lot of uh, biologically meaningful information, ecologically meaningful information, providing new insights. Um, it can also be a really valuable public engagement tool and uh, to help people realize um, the effects of restoring a pond and, 
and to be able to listen to everything come back um, but also to to appreciate and value local um, local ponds and, and local environments and it's quite hard I think to to visualize just how biodiverse ponds can be because um, you look at them and you know you can't really see what's going on underneath the water but uh, listening to them just highlights all that amazing biodiversity that they have and so I think can be an effective um, conservation tool. Um, so just to summarize then, um, pond soundscapes are packed with biological information and noise um, and we can use ecoacoustics to reveal novel insights into the ecosystem function and condition of uh, not just ponds perhaps but also to rivers and, and to lakes and then the underwater sound recordings are really valuable for, for public engagement so finally i'd like to say thanks to my collaborators camille carlos harry and tom uh, to my supervisors gareth martin and carl and to my funders nurk and the gw4 fresh um, with that i'd like to say thank you very much um, it's been a really nice um, opportunity to, to speak at such length and something that I love. And um, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>